Hey, uh, we are here to, to announce, happy to announce, uh, the truth behind Project X. It's top secret. <laughs> Tippity top. Uh, and that is, tomorrow begins the start of Advent. <laughs> We're doing a tobacco Advent this year. So thank you for contributing to that. Yeah, so we, uh, if you caught that announcement, we asked folks to send us, if they wouldn't mind, a sample of their favorite or one of their favorite pipe tobaccos. Hey guys, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Welcome to Tobacco Advent 2014, Day 1. Well, good morning. Scott good from AristaCobb.com here. Good morning, Seth from <laughs> TheShrinkingPastor.com here. And together, the three of us. You, and me, <laughs> and him. <laughs> are, no, you better keep going. The people are watching. <laughs> now I edit this, so we, we keep going. Hi, Scott from Aristocob.com here. We've said this part. <laughs> Welcome to day one of the 2015 Tobacco Advent Countdown to Christmas. Woohoo! Hey guys, Scott from Aristocob.com here. And Seth from I'm so excited I can't contain it, it's Christmas! Here. <laughs> this is uh, our Countdown to Christmas, and this is day one, means December 1st. Join us every day through Christmas for a special adventure in tasting tobacco. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a real special adventure this year. Um... Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. What's up? <laughs> He's taking stage direction way too literally. I told him, hey, we don't need to yell Merry Christmas. We've done that in the past, and it was kind of overwhelming with the sound, and so that, that's what I get. Merry Christmas. S sub. Sub. <laughs> Welcome to the 2017 Tobacco Advent. Woo! <laughs> Day one. Merry Christmas oh. again. Hi, boy. Merry Christmas Hi. to you. Man, this uh, tobacco yeah. advent has just flown by. I know. I can't believe we've come to the end, but wait, we haven't. Welcome back once again, and welcome to Tobacco Advent 2018 Day 1. Hey. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Hey, welcome to Tobacco Advent 2018 Day 25, Christmas Day, the day we've been counting down, counting up to. Yeah. Pretty exciting. Hey, Scott from Aristocob.com here. And Seth from, I don't have a website anymore, so, dot com. I should see if that's available. You really should. I don't have a website anymore, dot com. Together, along with you, the three of us, we are Mark with Men's Breakfast Club. Welcome back once again, and good morning, boy. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, I'm back to work this week. Hey, how's that going for you? So, <laughs> seems to be going great. Yeah, good. I, I have no complaints right now. Mm. <laughs> We're obviously recording this the week ahead of the week I'm back to work, but uh, I'm sure it's going well. You know, I, I was uh, at physical therapy today, and they put me on a recumbent bike, and the guy said, look, I'm going to move you up a little bit closer. This will require you to bend your knees a little bit more. Fine. So I go 10 minutes on this recumbent bike, and uh, when I get done, my, my incision has split open and I'm bleeding. Oh. <laughs> so apparently I was bending my knee more than I had been bending. But this is the best I have felt post-physical therapy since the surgery. That's great. So, yeah, I, I've, I mean, and I push myself hard and I'm sweating and bleeding and everything. And, um, yeah, it's good. That's awesome. Yeah. I am finally mostly 95 percent recovered i i did something to my back last week pulled pulled my back somehow i'm, I'm fearful it's my bed i haven't slept in my bed in, in over a week um but was uh we had a annual pumpkin carving evening here at the house I was doing a lot of stuff and in, in, in preparation for that and setting up tents and moving fire pits and mowed the lawn and by the end of that night, my back hurt, 
and the next day it really hurt and the next day it really really mm. hurt and i went to the doctor and they believe i had pulled a muscle um they gave me some some heavy duty painkillers and um uh, muscle relaxers and thankfully uh, i will say flying um with that sort of pain really sucked yeah uh flying uh, the trip to florida and, and even continuing the medication and getting better and, and healing while i was gone even the flight home when i was feeling like 80 percent better um it just was not comfortable at all hmm. so hear that. thankfully sure. thankfully I'm, I'm down to just tylenol and have been sleeping in a, a recliner um we'll probably do that again tonight and then give the bed a try um I'm, I'm hoping hoping it's something that i just did stupid yeah um mm. and it's not something that'll continue it stinks i i don't yeah. envy the people that deal with chronic back pain yeah well that the, the the knee thing i've been back in bed for a while but there have been a couple nights that i'm up at two and not back in bed so i've had to head mm. back to the recliner um just you know can't can't stay in one position for too long mm -hmm. and be comfortable like the leg wants to stiffen up but uh man sorry to hear that that's that stinks so one of the things i want to talk with you about and you about a little bit today you know I, I don't share on my channel the channels that i'm subscribed to and i've said this before it's because i really don't need for everyone to see how often I, I click a like button on um, the Cal Sills or the Partridge Family or a Brady Bunch episode. All the time. All the time. Assume it is non-stop. <laughs> but uh, I, I do, I have very diverse interests and because I know what I want to smoke and I know the pipes that I'm going to smoke in, if 5% if of my viewing is within the YTPC, I would be surprised. Um, not that I don't watch certain channels within the YTPC, but it's not so much for pipes and mm -hmm. for personalities, sure. stories, and things like that. There's a lesson for you, by the way, if you're wondering about what kind of content should you produce and how many times can you talk about your favorite blend. Don't worry about it. Talk about something else. Um, anyway, some of the channels that I really enjoy, um, there's a, a, a channel called the, uh, the Den of Tools. And it's a guy who is obsessed with Harbor Freight products. Hmm. And one of the things that's kind of fascinating about him is... I mean, who isn't, though? That's true. One of the funny things about him is he has this bear who is an avatar. And so he is very, very rarely seen on video. Usually it's this bear, this animated bear that is talking. And it's, it's just a bizarre little gimmick that, that he uses. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, he, there are some folks that have, have said that he's a shill, and there are some things that I've seen him do and things I've heard him say that I thought, okay, come on now. This is just a little bit too much in, in favor of Harbor Freight. Not everything that they do is perfect, and he's had plenty of videos that he, he's not acknowledged that. But what, what apparently happened the other day, I'm watching one of his, his videos, and somebody on YouTube had singled him out for criticism, calling him a shill, saying that his his videos where he's doing tests and things, that they're ridiculous tests and so on. So I went looking around to see if I could figure out who this person was, and I found them, and I have no interest in watching them. The guy's foul mouth and his videos, the, the ones in particular that I, that, that I was drawn to or, or directed to, was him basically saying how if you're looking for a tool review, an honest tool review, he's the only one who's going to give you the honest tool review. And then he names these other people that have YouTube channels and, and talks about how horrible they are. And, and I thought, what a, what a, just a nasty thing to do. You know, uh, our, our moms taught us if you can't say anything nice, this don't say anything at all. And I, and I wish that that was this guy's policy, but it's not. And um, several people then that he attacked, I went and found their channels and a couple of them I subscribed to because I like this guy. Mm -hmm. I like his approach. I liked his reaction to that guy's criticism. put down the criticism. 
And I looked at some of their videos and thought, no, I think this guy's being pretty fair. Another kind of um, genre of video that I enjoy, and it's mostly because I'm a foodie, is there are a couple guys who do food reviews that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. And they're fast food reviews. And I don't eat a lot of fast food, but whenever somebody comes up with something novel, like when we did a video a while, a couple years ago from Taco Bell because they had their meat taco mm -hmm. or the taco shell was made of chicken. chicken. Um, one of them is uh, a guy out of Canada named Ken, I wanna say Dominic, but I don't think that that's correct. Um, Another one is a guy named Dame, Dame Drops. I like Dame. Does he still do stuff? He does. What about the Report of the Week? I every now and then watch the Report of the Week. So funny. But what's funny, Ken and the kid that does Report of the Week both encouraged me to buy this. So this is a, a tray seen that. that you can clip on your steering wheel. And, you know, um, I'm usually eating out traveling with uh with co-workers and with customers and so on but if i'm at at the office alone i'm going to go out and grab lunch i'll typically go to zaxby's and get some chicken wings and go sit in the park and <laughs> that is one of the hardest things to sit and eat on your lap you know there's just a lot of a lot of stuff to manage there and uh, so i i haven't used it yet your lap's not big enough but i think it's interesting now the one thing i did notice though I did stick it on the steering wheel and it didn't work. Uh oh, yeah, that's what I said. Uh oh. Uh, but then I turned my steering wheel around and it did work because of the airbag. It, it's just mm. it, it ended up going on and was holding up like that. Um, and there's two sides to it. There's the I guess what they consider a work side. Mm. You can hold your pen here, and uh, this cup side that thing. has a cup holder and a little bit smaller tray. But. Um, First, I, I looked at it and I saw that they were about $10 on Amazon. And I thought, you know what, I can make that. It's a little bit of Baltic birch and this wouldn't cost anything to produce. Um, and then I looked around and saw I didn't have any Baltic birch. And I thought, well, am I gonna spend $30 on a sheet of Baltic birch to get this much usage out of it? Or am I just gonna pay $10 and buy this? I paid $10. Yeah, if you had a CNC and some plywood, you could crank those out. CNC? But... I that's mean, nothing. That's not a difficult. Sure. If I had a sheet of, of MDF or a, right. sheet, of, a sheet of uh, plywood, and it. yes, that's true. Anyway, kind of weird. Um, I don't expect to do food reviews in my car, but I, I do expect to get a lot less food on me. Yeah, uh, yeah. I too eat at Zaxby's often. It's a uh, one of the best keto spots, low carb spots getting chicken wings. Um, I don't have a problem eating that in the car. I guess I've just mastered the art of one hand chicken wing eating, just hold the tray. And, um, my concern with that, being a fat man, an extra fat man, is is there gonna be enough depth here between me and the steering wheel to fit that? Well, like, I, I can't put the tray that down. That was my first concern. I can't put the tray down all the way on an airline, mm -hmm. an airplane at, at present. Um, so that's neat. It, 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 it fit. Um, it's kind of a stupid thing. Yeah. But um, did you see, um, have you seen any of the lock picking lawyers videos this week? No. Do you subscribe to the lock picking lawyer? I, I am subscribed. With? Yes. Uh, if you don't know, the lock, lock picking lawyer is one of the most prolific um, lock picking YouTube channels. He's got almost a thousand videos at this point between him and Bosnian Bill. Bosnian Bill. Um, they're two of the most uh, lockpickingist guys on YouTube. Um, he, Lockpicking Lawyer, um, has done four videos in the last week or two with another YouTuber that I don't follow who is more of a, um, not hacking, but it's a, the, uh, a security exploitation okay. people. So more than just lock picking, um, finding ways to get into places and, and showing kind of just security flaws in different systems. They do these four videos that are just astonishing. They're sitting in front of a 
sitting in front of a door with a keypad, a number keypad, and they show four different methods for breaking into that door without actually picking a lock. Hmm. Um, the one that is perhaps the simplest uh, is to use 35 millimeter film. You take the film, you fold it, so you put a crease in it. You take the two halves, crease side down through the top of the door frame, drop it down, and then the upper layer, you put a little bit extra so that what happens is where that crease is, it gets pushed towards the door and it creates a gap. You then slide it over to the handle. So one thing, this is a, this is a, um, like an office handle that's got a, uh, horizontal lever, lever, uh -huh. lever handle, um, not a knob. And so doing it that way creates a loop that you can slide over the handle and you pull it tight and just go pop, pops it right open. So he shows, he shows four different methods. Uh, if you want to go, that's, that's the over the door method under the door. There's this thing that is, it's basically a coat hook or, a uh, um, coat hanger that's been straightened out. Yes. And they use a, um, you know, the, uh, the things that you would attach your, um, key card to yeah. that's got zzz, one yeah, of those a things. lanyard. Yeah. Um, but the retractable one, you attach that to that, you slide it under the door, you pull on it, it pops up, you slide it over and you pull and just click right through. Um, you know the credit card trick? Uh, sliding your credit card through, if you can get your credit card in. Yeah, um, one of the tools he uses is just a hook. It's just a thin bar um, thin wire like this with a small hook on the end. It's thin enough that you can get in, under, and pop. There it goes. It's, it is so scary. Mm. It is so scary. Oh, and the other one, I, I just remember the last one. The last one is um, if the, the hinges are on the outside of the door, you could use a hammer or you sure. could do that. There is a hinge remover tool that is basically a pin, a spring, and a weight on the end. Yeah, you pull it and let go. Mm -hmm. And it just, the pin just launched straight out. Holy cow. Uh, the door bypassed Spring. without picking a lock. So these, these techniques, as, as you said, though, are for interior doors. Most, most businesses and most secure homes, there's a very, very simple hinge that you can buy that has um, on, on one of the leaves, imagine a butt hinge on your door, mm -hmm. on one of the leaves there's a hole, on the other leaf there's a, a pin or a little tab that sticks out. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the very first time I saw that, it was being described in a magazine, they actually drilled a hole in this one and then, and then ran a nail that was sticking proud in another hole so that when the door is closed, if you pull the pin out, you can't get the door off uh, uh -huh. from the closed position. And I, I see those in, in use um, on entry doors. There's there's other little things that are built into the bolt that prevent you from using the, the key card mm -hmm. and the hook, right? But those are not typically found on interior doors. Well, and and this was this is a, a like a office security door. Yeah. So it would be it would be an interior door, but it would be an interior door for an office. Had a, a, a big number pad. He, you know, one of the things that's nice about it is they're talking about these things to show, um, after every one, how can you protect yourself against this right. vulnerability. That's the point. And um, one of the things that he did point out with the the pin that, that snuck behind, like the credit card, he said, look, the, 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 the plate here is the incorrect plate, right? Mm. So, so this, if the door was installed correctly would be much more difficult, maybe even impossible. However, many doors are installed with the wrong plate. Or if anything happens and you replace the door, many times people don't replace the plate. Right. And so you end up in a situation where you're just as vulnerable. It just can't latch. No. They, they were great. Any of these videos, if you're looking for a lock, if you're looking for a travel lock, a padlock, a bike lock, go to the Lock Picking Lawyers videos and search the lock mm -hmm. because he will tell you if it is a piece of junk or not. And most of them are a piece of junk that are easy to bypass. A lot of the battery battery powered entry locks, quick set, and you know those locks that you can buy 
there are three different grades in, in a lot of, of hardware. Drawer slides for your kitchen, for example, hinges for your kitchen. There are three different grades of hardware. And the, the three grades are grade one, two, and three. Grade one would be for your most demanding application. So a, a grade one hinge you would want to use in an institution, you know, a, a federal building, um, a, a retail store where that door is going to get opened again and again Hospital and again. Drawer slides, grade one, if you're at a rental car agency, and uh, this, you always see this, the doors dangling on their hinges and mm -hmm. the drawers are failing because they use the wrong grade. Grade two is pretty typical for a home. Um, all of your European style concealed hinges, the ones that go into the back of the door into a hole, a very mm -hmm. large hole, those are all grade two. They just can't handle the test that's required to pass grade three, I'm sorry, grade one. Grade three is any hinge. A piece of tape is a grade three mm -hmm. hinge. You don't test anything to be grade three, it just is. It means it can't pass the other test. Well, a lot of those entry locks, especially the ones that you'll see stacked on an end cap, and they're $79. If you look at the back of them and look at the fine, fine print, you will see grade three. So don't waste your money. Uh, if, you're looking for, if you're looking for security for your front door and you want the convenience of a push pad or a, a you know, thumb scanner, just don't even think about grade three. Well, and, and beyond that, a lot of the lock companies have their own grading system for the complexity of their locks. Um, you know, so I think master has like six different levels of, of difficulty. Um, yeah, something but, you can't bump, yeah, for but, example. But, but many of those, many of those, even the, the top level ones, um, you know, they're using really, really heavy steel on the shackle, right? Um, but, uh, there's no shielding on the core. And so what that means is if you have the right tool, if you have that same, um, raking tool, you can go straight in past the keyway and, and straight to the very back and unlock it. And unlock it with, and, and so you have, you have this really incredibly tough lock body with little protection. M much of it is just security theater at that point. Um, I have heard the same thing about the, a lot of the digital locks, the ones that require a thumbprint or some of those things. Girl. The weakness in those, the more technologically advanced it appears to be, typically the weakness is the lock. They'll put a very secure thumbprint reader with the crappiest, cheapest grade three Chinese yeah. lock. Mm -hmm. um, or the opposite will happen. Sometimes they use a really strong lock, but the actual battery powered thing, uh, there's a quick release and you, there's a reset button you can press because they didn't take the electronics into consideration. Um, it, it is, some of the ways that they find to bypass these are just incredible. The, the, one of those guys was showing how there is a default management setting on most safes in, or in the hotel rooms. Yeah. And that when you install them, you, you, you change that. Right. But most hotels don't bother to change it. Mm -hmm. And they say, so all you do is you do dit, 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 and you're in. And they showed that on several of them. Another one, there was a magnets. hole, a little access yeah. point. That you just stick a pin in and right. you're in. Or magnets. Right. So you can use a magnet to mm -hmm. pull a latch. Yes. Um, yeah, I saw that one recently too. One of the ones, um, a lot of the gun safes, a surprising number of, of home gun safes, have a, have a, where the hinge closes, um, you can, with a thin, again, coat hanger, slide through a corner. There's no shielding on that. So you can slide through the corner and either physically open the lock or push through and reset the, the thumbprint reader and, and change it to default. It's just, it's crazy. Um, what you said about it being theater, a lot of what we do with TSA is theater. Oh, yeah. Right? To make people feel feel safer because oh they're patting people down totally but uh, you, you hear about how many times they pass a fake bomb or gun or something mm -hmm. through security um it's a little scary yeah. well yeah that's a, those are really good channels yeah i agree i, I watch a couple of those too yeah uh, but I'm, I'm curious from you um 
what are some of your go-to channels? I'll, I'll link down below some of the ones that we were just talking about um, if you have any interest in those. But I'm curious about when you're not watching you know, YTPC videos, what are you interested in? Um, my brother-in-law has been watching a lot of guitar lessons because he wants to learn how to play a guitar. Cool. That's that's really cool. I like a lot of musical stuff. I even have a, another YouTube channel that's music related. Mm -hmm. um, how, how about you? you? You like a lot of 3D printing and nerdy stuff too, right? Yeah, I, I watch a lot of different types of YouTube channels. I'll watch things about gaming, a lot of Minecraft stuff. Um, a lot of nerdy, kind of do-it-yourself channels, 3D printing channels. It's always neat to see ways that people are are finding to, to utilize these things. Um, some tech, tech review channels. It's just, it's good to, I'm interested in that stuff in general, and I enjoy keeping up on it. I need for you to print me something, by the way. Okay. Have you, have you been on Thingiverse.com? This one introduced me to it. It's a website where people who have created designs that can be 3D printed, where they share them, open source. And you wanna make this? Yeah, okay, here you go. If you have a 3D printer, you can print this. And uh, I, I just thought on a lark, I went and I searched Shopsmith. Mm -hmm. There's a dozen Shopsmith items there. There's a little coupling that you use to power your bandsaw off of the main power plant. And it's about a $23 coupling. It's not crazy expensive, but you know what? If you can print one for a dollar, mm -hmm. why not? I don't want to use a spring. The the oh, original the one does use a spring. Okay. Yeah. That, the white. None plastic. of theirs use a spring. None of their designs. That's one concern I have about the designs they have. Uh, here, I'm going to get all shopsmithy on you. But that coupling, part of its purpose is to drive accessories but part of its purpose is to make sure that it's not creating an unsafe situation. Right. So it's made with a particular strength that will shear if something would happen right. on your joint or you're running a, th a board through and there's a nail, you don't want that thing to power through. Right. Um, and so it'll shear and then it also has a spring. So if you forget to lock the headstock, the power plant down, it will push the headstock away, it'll disengage. Mm -hmm so that you don't get yourself in a situation where, again, maybe you're running through a planer or a joiner and suddenly you lose power. Yeah. Not good. None of those designs have the spring. Yeah, I, I would be interested in that. And, and also, you would want to make it in the right material because yeah. it's got to have enough strength. Yeah. Um, so the next... I have two 3D printers currently, and I've got my eyes on another one. Uh, I won't be allowed to buy it for a while, but um, the next next one that I get will be resin, a resin-based 3D printer. Resin is much stronger, um, much finer detail. Do and you actually, have to cure it after it's... You do. Okay, so UV curing? It is, yeah. So, um, But resin is better if you need something that's watertight. It's better if you need something that is higher... Um, quality. Um, it's something uh, that you need it, if you need something that's stronger. Uh, unless you're printing with some of the like nylon filaments. There are some filaments that are really strong, but getting those to print right on the type of printer I have is, is a challenge because you have to have the, the heating right. It's got to be the right conditions. You, you have to kind of have a heated enclosure, which I don't have at the moment. Um, with the resin, you a lot of that is easier. It's also neat because you can actually print at a higher volume faster. So with with um, the type of printer I have, every the nozzle has to move. It's la putting down layers as the plastic is being poured out, right, from the, the heated um, nozzle. With resin printers, um, the print bed is sitting on a uh, screen that is that is layer by layer shining UV light and curing the entire layer at one time. So let's say we wanted to manufacture um, these. If, if it was on my 3D printer uh, and I had five of them or, or six of them laid out, it would go layer, 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 layer. And, and so it's laying down the first layer and then it's going to go around to the second layer. 
On the other type of 3D printer, it actually prints upside down, but all six of them, layer one, layer two, layer three, and so if you're doing multiple pieces, it, it, it prints much faster. So something like that, I would be interested and concerned about the strength of it. Yeah. Um, it would have to be the right material, and I'm, so I'm curious what the people well, there are recommending. Yeah, there, and there's first off, there's there's discussion because I ended up there after seeing a YouTube video of a guy who was doing it, and as I went down to make a comment, I noticed that 17 people had already left the same comment, mm. and that is, will this shear what it needs to shear? Right. And the guy uh, on Thingiverse made a note about that and said that I don't know. And if you make this, you're doing this at your own risk. Yeah. And so um, then there's several versions. One guy has made like three different versions and he's making them. Originally they were hollow and it, right. they failed immediately. And then so he started to build how, what is the Changing proper the amount infill to fill layers. it? Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is smart. You know, one of the things that Shopsmith did is they had a research and development lab where they would destroy things. And they had they had solid steel versions of components that were not made in steel. So if you bought a Shopsmith headstock, parts of it are steel, parts of it are aluminum, parts of it are plastic, and so on. Well, they had one headstock that had every single component made out of steel, and they could take one of those components out and test different plastic versions, hmm. different metal versions. And that way they, they could uh, value engineer if necessary, or they could also engineer it for safety. And, uh, and then the, the most amazing torture tests, one of them that, that uh, I remember watching them do one day, because they were testing a plastic component, was they put a sanding disc, a 12-inch disc on it. They had the machine turn on, and you always have to start it at a low speed. So they had this device that would turn the machine on, turn the speed up, and then they had brake calipers that would just suddenly hit that sander like, like, a, like, like a brake disc and stop it in an instant and they had bags of lead and they had it bolted down and everything and that thing would just go boom jump <laughs> and they would do it again and again and again and again until that one part would fail wow. and then they would swap it out with a steel one and they would go on to the next one really interesting and it's like yeah, that's what you have to do yeah. you, know, you have to know what's going to happen and uh yeah so i mean if if anytime that you're 3d printing um, or making your own version, you know, out of whatever material, um, if you're casting it or whatever, um, you have to assume some of the risk for that, or you have to pony up to twenty three dollars and buy the official version. Um, I need to pony up and buy a better stick. I think, you know, and so somebody, if you if you've got a lot of experience and whatever, maybe you, you take the risk, or um, like we've discussed before maybe it's 50% as reliable, but if you can make 10 of them uh, for $10 and one is $23, then when it breaks, you just throw a new one on. I, I would say if I were running my belt sander or a strip sander or a scroll saw or something that, you know what, if it stopped, it wouldn't matter. Yeah. A couple tools I wouldn't, I wouldn't drive with that. Yeah. Um, the, the moment that, that always stops my heart and this has happened to me at least a dozen times over the years, is I'll be cleaning up with my dust collector, Shopsmith made dust collector. And I cut the hose and I'm cleaning it up and all of a sudden I see that white coupling fly into the end of the hose. And, and, the, and the first thing I do is I reach over and I grab the hose and pull it out. And uh, on a couple of occasions, as I pull it, I see it launching into the dust collector and the impeller, the, the big blower, is also made of a, of a, I think it's a glass reinforced resin of some sort. Now it only has four blades on it. Originally, I want to say it had eight blades, the original design, and it wasn't made as strong. And immediately when that would happen, you would hear the, the thing impact the impeller, and then the dust collector would go, whoa, 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 whoa. And that's the sound of the impeller with a broken fan broken. on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and your twenty two dollar coupler is also destroyed yeah. by that, and you can't put you know chicken wire or something in there because you're gonna get all clogged up with sawdust. You just have to kind of keep an eye on your your couplings. Yeah. So, 
Anyway, it'd be kind of cool because some of these designs are shorter than the Shopsmith one, which I could see taking those and maybe incorporating into them a rare earth magnet. So mm -hmm. you could stick it on and have it just stay right on the bandsaw or belt mm -hmm. sander and, and not share them and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just have it dedicated right to the yeah. tool. Yeah, again, it's the advantage of that, that manufacturing your own stuff. Yeah. Do you have, might as well ask this, I've been meaning to anyway, do you have either a vacuum... Uh, Shop vac? No, a pressure oh. vacuum seal tank or it's the other one. Um, one sucking air out, one pushing it in. <laughs> Either of those? Okay, so like a vacuum bag? No, like, like, no, no, no. But like you're a, talking a tank. Like a, a yes, tank. I do. I do. Do you? I do. The, the, one, the one that I have it was originally designed for paint. You can fill it with paint, and then you can pressurize it with an air Perfect. compressor, and then you can use various devices. But you can also use it for vacuum. So if you what you're wanting to do Two is ways. you want Sweet. resin to penetrate I something... I want both. You do that. Uh, yeah. So I, I want to make some um, resin uh, Dungeons & Dragons dice. And oh, you gotta get the, get there your, are two ways you can use out. the vacuum to get the bubbles out, but then you can use the high pressure to get a, a, a higher, uh, better, yeah, better um, intrusion into the number. Gotcha. Slides. Yeah, so, I have one. Yes, because those things are not cheap. What do you power that with? Air compressor. Air compressor. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. So I've been looking at those. Harbor Freight makes one they're like eighty bucks. Yeah, for probably, probably sure it's the tank. one I have. Tank, yeah, sure it, it uh, looks like a, it's like a pressure cooker. Ocean, the bolts yes. on top. Yeah, yeah awesome. Looks like, it looks like a pressure cooker. Sweet. So maybe I'll make a video about that because I'm thinking Christmas gifts would be fun. Seeing mm -hmm. a number of videos of those those happening and have not ever played with any sort of resin. Well, um, I need, I need or to, molds. I need to play with you with that because yeah. um, one of the things that I want to make That's, is yeah. you can make resin, um, what do they call it? Stabilized, resin stabilized corn cobs. So you can take a corn cob, put it in resin, oh. pressurize it, or put it in a vacuum. And then once that cures, you can turn it like turning a pen blank. Yeah. But it's a beautiful corn cob. Cool. And you can buy them. You can buy pre-stabilized yeah. corn cobs at Woodcraft and Rockler, companies like that. But they're really expensive. And you don't really have any control over the quality. Where I could buy a bunch of corn cobs, uh, basically buy feed corn that you would use for hunting. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a very small cob that would be fine for, for turning. And you could pick through them and pick the 10 best ones and not mess with right. ones that are not going to come out well. And That'd be cool. make them pretty cheap. So, Yeah, if, if I'm remembering right, I think the pressure chamber is used for the silicone to remove air bubbles from the silicone. For because molds. if you don't do that, your molds will be potted. And then I think the pressure is for filling the... Gotcha. The silicone molds, hmm. I think. I don't know. I've been watching lots of videos. Um, I just remember uh, Grant from King of Random doing it years ago with the glass, the plexiglass, and the proto putty. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. made the, the Grant, uh, King of Random had a phenomenal just tutorial. just passed away, by the sorry, way. Had a phenomenal tutorial on how to make one using his proto putty. Which, have you ever made that? I have crazy, not, but I know exactly what you're talking so about. So it's it's a mix of cornstarch and silicone um, uh, sealing, sealant, um, caulk, silicone mm -hmm. caulk, and you mix it up, and it, it turns into a putty that will solidify, and it basically turns into rubber. Uh, we made one once, some once for a project at work. It's weird. Hmm. It's hard to get it right because the silicone is very sticky. Um, and getting it to that point where it's it's almost like a dough um, is tricky. Do you do you put a release agent when you then cast in it or no? So so you can add food coloring, but then the so you're not casting in that. You're the way he is basically creating a, a rubber gasket. 
um, okay. silicone gasket. So that would not be used for the silicone mold. So this is what he was using on this, the, the lid of his vacuum chamber. That's he right. Made. So he, that. he pushed it around the tank and then yeah. he put his lid on. And so that created the seal for the vacuum chamber. Okay. Yeah. That's, so that's cool. He did a lot of stuff with marshmallows and, you know, fun, fun, fun tests. Fun of stuff. Um, I mentioned one more channel. I was just talking to boy about this today. Um, it's a channel by a husband and wife called Evan and Caitlin. And what was really funny is I've been listening to now for 10 years, I'm sorry, for about four years, a podcast that has three pretty popular YouTubers on it. Jimmy DiResta being one of my favorites. Um, and, uh, Bob, Bob Claggett. Some, I um, like to make stuff. I like to make stuff. And, um, I always forget the other guy's name. Forgive me. David Prosciutto. No, that's a, that's a, that's ever, a bacon. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> he used to have, uh, like he changed the name of his channel. So huh. anyway, at the end of every single episode, they list off their top uh, patrons from Patreon and they thank them in, by name. And uh, for four years, I've heard, hey, we want to thank our top uh, sponsors, Evan and Caitlin. And the other day, I'm looking on the homepage of uh, YouTube, and because I'd watched something similar, there's this video recommended. And, and I click on it and it says, hi, we're Evan and Caitlin. Evan and Caitlin. And uh, they've had a channel for a couple of years and they actually have several channels, including a gaming channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they did a video. They do a lot of 3D printing, a lot of DIY stuff around the house. They're getting crazy with resin, maybe a little too much with resin. But they they did a um, they've got a new kind of a series where they are buying something and they're making the same thing and comparing bought versus DIY. Mm. And they made a stained glass kind of a a rainbow triangular shaped rainbow and. Uh, it was pretty cool. And they made a wooden frame that they glued down and then they poured the different color resins into this. What I really like about the channel though, is they show them screwing up. Yeah. And, and okay, the, you know, we were close, but we didn't get this right. He's an engineer, she's a designer. And together they, they've designed some pretty cool stuff. They've got really great t-shirts. The t-shirt, <laughs> one t-shirt says, make, fail, make, fail. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, they, they wear that one almost every episode. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll link to them. I recommend you check them out. Um, I, I find them entertaining, but like I say, I, I like watching channels of makers, but especially I, I appreciate makers that either show you different approaches or they're willing to share their fails. Or at the end, uh, Bob does this all the time. Of I like to make stuff. At the end, he's like, uh, you know, if, if I were to do this again, here's what I would do differently. Now, here's here's what I'm not happy with. This is fine for now, but you know I might do it again and, and would change X Y Z. Yeah, he does it all the time. I, I watch a couple Canadian woodworkers, and uh, one of the guys he's he's kind of a curmudgeon, but um, he he does uh, some videos every now and again where he will begin the video by saying, "Total fail. I don't recommend you doing this. This is what we learned." <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I appreciate that. And there, yeah. you know, he spent a week building this thing and designing it in SketchUp and then building it and filming it. He needs to put a video out. Yeah. But he's willing to say right up front, this plan's not going to be available for you. You don't need to do this. I'm going to keep working on this. He's done some vices and clamps and things that he's made himself. And I, I commented a couple years ago on one of his videos where he was making wooden threads. And, and his approach was pretty backwards, and I, I just thought it was kind of dumb. And I left a comment that I later regretted. And his comment back to me made me regret my comment. And I realized that, you know what, I, I, shame on me. He doesn't need me to be a critic. Um, and, and he did what he did because he was trying to learn something. Hmm. And it, it's like, gosh, you can buy a threading device for a fraction of what you spent and the time that you spent to build this, that wasn't the point. He wanted to make it. He yeah. wanted to accomplish it. And it changed me. Um, just this week, I commented on a guy on Instagram that I follow who's uh, he's making a, a wooden table, and there's these little metal brackets 
that you can buy for five cents a piece that he made. He made these. He cut them out of steel. He drilled and countersunk and ground them. And it's like, you know what? In the end, they weren't half as nice as ones you could buy. He wasted a bunch of time doing it, but he used a lot of tools he's never used before. Yeah. He gained some skills, and he built every single part on that table except for the screws. And who knows? Maybe the next thing he'll do is make screws. Yeah. So good for him. That's like, uh, what's his face? Your buddy in South Carolina? Um, and the is centipede. he? Yeah. Izzy yeah, Swan, is he Swan? Uh, recently made a centipede, and, and the video starts with, yeah, his first one was a failure. Um, did, did a total redesign. I'm going to show you videos of the first one, and then we'll look at uh, we'll look at uh, attempt number two. So what's cool is I was in his shop, and he had the centipede there. Steve is the name of the centipede. <laughs> And he was working on some other parts that clearly were not the centipede that's in front of me. And I said, so what are you working on now? He goes, um, I'm making a new one. What? It's 10 foot long, cordless drilled powered, remote control wooden centipede. He wasn't happy with it. So he made another one. Yeah. Super talented, way more patience than I have. Really cool guy. Izzy Swan, we'll link to him as well. Uh, so I think about a half hour ago, I said, you know, link to videos that uh, that you watch, channels you watch. We'll do the same. We need to wrap this up. I smoked that pipe for two days. <laughs> Last week episode, this week's episode. That's a very small pipe. And I will say it has a lot to do with the cake. It's a, it's a nice, dense, like a flake um, that burned a good long time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I enjoyed that. And uh, Andy, I'll say once again, thank you for the pipe. I don't usually smoke a pipe that's that small, but I was able to smoke that probably for 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. So we'll wrap it up. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Good to see you, boy. You too. See you guys.